Hey everyone, welcome to the data storytelling lecture uh, for FDOM uh, this week on Thanksgiving. So we're doing this uh, over video, of course, since we won't be meeting in class on Wednesday. So when we think about data storytelling or data in general, we oftentimes think that data is this kind of new phenomenon. And in a way it is because we now have more of an emphasis on data and analytics and, and things that can help us tell stories. But in reality, we've been collecting data and using data to tell stories for decades, um, so you know, any, you know, we can think back to the early 1900s and the census here, and this is all data, right? It's names, it's birthplaces, it's relationships, it's gender, it's age, it's you know what languages they speak. All of this is data that was then used to um, tell a story or um, carry over a narrative in one way or another. Now, of course, just about everything we do involves some sort of data. Uh, component to it, whether it's social, whether it's our car, um, we'll talk about uh, you know all the things that collect data, and of course this is only continuing to increase. So um, the tools that we use, or the platforms that we use, or the you know the cars we drive, the things we have in our home, they're all collecting data and using data in one way or another as part of that. So let's just go over a couple of the things that actually collect our data. Uh, we'll start with the social networks because they're probably the ones that come to mind first. So you know, for instance, Facebook, you have uh, all kinds of data sets, not just what you do on Facebook, your posts and things like that. You have your engagements on Facebook. So things that you like, things that you comment on, things that you share, you have your friends, you have your age, you have all your biographical information. You have the pages that you associate with um, all of your um, contacts, it, it just everything on Facebook. Think about it in a data set because um, that's essentially how Facebook makes a lot of its money is by then using that data that it has about you for very targeted ads um, from brands and companies. Um, Twitter doesn't collect as much data, but again, everything on Twitter that we would do uh, is a form of data. So all the tweets that you're doing are data in a way, um, but then all the engagements that you have on data uh, are on Twitter are also data. So tweets that you like, things that you retweet. Um, your bio is uh, data, your images are data. So all of those things uh, come together as data sets. Same thing with Instagram, again, all your posts, all of your engagements on Instagram, um, the things you do there, it's all data. Um, these companies then use that data to um, sell very targeted ads to you that are oftentimes more effective than generic kind of mass targeted ads. Um, when you stop and think about your phone, this is probably the thing that knows the most about us, right? So when I ask students what their phone knows about them, they generally say everything. So um, what types of apps you use, who you communicate with, what types of communication do you use, what time do you wake up, what time do you go to bed? Uh, I mean, you just stop and think about all the information that our phone has on us. It's pretty uh, mind-blowing the the, uh, you know, it's either a good thing or a bad thing. Some people are very leery about all the data that uh, your phone that Apple or Google might have on you based off of the products that we use of theirs. Likewise, any web browser, especially Chrome, which most of us log into Chrome if you use Gmail or uh, YouTube on a regular basis, um, Chrome controls all of our email, controls all of our web searches, it controls where we visit, um, you know, what we do on the web. So again, Chrome, Google has a ton of that information on us. Uh, Gmail, again, your contacts, all of the email that you're sending. Um, if you've ever gotten an ad for something based off of an email conversation you just had with someone, that's because um, you know Google's looking for those keywords and ads and then using that for targeted ads. So that's why those ads are so effective um, because they're using your keywords in order to do that. Uh, if you think about traffic apps like Google Maps or Waze, not only do they know where you're going, they know how fast you're driving, they know the route you took, um, they know where police officers are, they know where traffic accidents are. So again, all of that is data. Um, there's a reason why apps like Waze in particular incorporate with Spotify because they know the type of commute you're going to be having and they have a playlist based off the data that they know of that drive. Um, when you think about apps like Netflix or Hulu, they know what you watch, they know what you want to watch, they know what you don't want to watch. Uh, so again, a lot of control there in terms of recommendations that are really important. You may not think about your car very much in terms of data, but um, I know my car knows the gas mileage that I get, it knows the speed that I drive. 
Um, if you have a navigation system in your car, it knows the routes you want to take, um, things along those lines. So your car is only going to continue to get smarter. Um, it probably knows your contacts. If you have Bluetooth connected to it, it knows um, the type of music you listen to. All of those things are in your car as well. It knows your air pressure and your tires. Again, all of these things uh, could be data points if we choose to. Um, we now have um, smart objects in our homes, so not just learning thermostats like Nest, where they learn your tendencies and adjust the temperature based on when you're home, when you're not home, what you usually like it at when you wake up in the morning, what you want it at when you go to bed at night. Uh, so that's data. I mean, that's how these learning uh, platforms end up using that as they take data and they make um, actionable patterns off of that data. Um, and then there's this whole idea of the Internet of Things, which is um, the idea that every product is eventually going to be connected in one way or another. Um, so when you think about, you know, smart home technology like Alexa and things like that, that would be considered. But really um, think about like smart refrigerators, uh, which are already a thing. They're very expensive right now, um, but they will scan what's in your refrigerator and let you know a recipe based off of what you have. Or they might print out your um, your shopping list, or they might send you a text saying, hey, you don't have any milk, make sure to get milk on the way home. So um, this is that whole interconnectedness of all the things in your house. So that's really cool for some people, and it's really scary for a lot of other people. Um, Target had a really interesting story happen in the past <laughs> couple years, um, and I'll go ahead and share this uh, with you right here, because this was the story that came out, is that Target accidentally, or not accidentally, Target sent um, some advertising about pregnancy items um, to this teenage girl, and her dad ended up going to Target, getting very upset with a manager, um, saying, you know, my daughter's, I think she was 15 or 16, like, how dare you be sending her this stuff? Uh, and Target obviously apologized and things like that, but the, the way Target, or the reason why Target sent that, that advertising in the mail to her is because they analyzed the data of shopping data, and they found that women, if you see here in this bottom paragraph, women who buy a lot of lotion um, were then uh, very oftentimes pregnant or at a certain point of their pregnancy, um, soap and cotton balls when they start buying a lot of scent-free soap and the extra huge bags of cotton balls. Uh, in addition to hand sanitizers. Again, these are all actionable patterns that Target takes from shopping information and knows, okay, most of the time when people are buying all this stuff together, it means they're pregnant. So this dad was very upset. Target apologized, um, but then um, Target called back later to apologize again on the phone. And you can see there in the bottom paragraph that the, uh, the dad ended up apologizing to Target saying that he found out later that his daughter actually was pregnant. So Target knew that his da daughter was pregnant based off of her shopping patterns before he did. So the list of data is endless, um, any of these things, and then the list could go on and on and on and on, um, could be data. When you think about um, data that's collected or data that we can act on or data that we can analyze, um, the, the possibilities truly are endless. So there are a lot of different ways to tell a story with data. Uh, I'm going to show you some examples here of just, um, you know, you probably think of data and you probably think of maps. Um, and maps are a big part of data uh, visualization. Um, they're not the only way to do them, but, you know, they often are very um, uh, effective when it comes to using data. So you can see here, this is population density. So the darker the red, the more heavily populated these areas are. So you can very quickly look at a map like this and tell where all the major cities are. Um, so when you stop to think about who might want information like this, um, people who do advertising by mail or hiring when they're looking to open up a, a location, you obviously want to go where the people are, things along those lines. So these maps matter more so than just putting data on a map. They tell a story. So they help uh, make decisions based on whatever it is that data is trying to tell. So here's another um, same map, obviously, it's of the United States, but the darker the red is the higher education of the population there. So you can see Denver there in Colorado is very high. Our area um, right there along the I-35 corridor is pretty high. Washington, D.C., 
um, New York, New England, that area is pretty high. So again, think about when companies might want to open up a new market or look for potential hires. Um, they're looking at maps like this to determine where they should possibly go um, and find an educated population. This is a map that tells a couple of different stories. So this is um, the severity of gun laws and the number of gun related deaths. So you can see the darker maroon or the darker red colors um, have less restrictive gun laws. So more free in terms of gun laws, whereas the states in white have more restrictive gun laws. Uh, and then the numbers there are the number of gun deaths, gun deaths per 100,000 people. So um, you look at a state like Texas, we have very, um, very little in terms of gun restrictions. I mean, you can see our number there, but then you look at a state like Alaska where they also have um, very few gun restrictions, but they have a much higher number. So you might then say, okay, well, what's the story here? Well, one, Alaska doesn't have many people. So one gun death there per 100,000 people obviously has going to be a higher percentage. Um, also, Alaska has a ton of not just hunting accidents, but also has a very high number of suicides as well. So again, data like this can help you tell a story um, based off of the pure numbers that you can look at. And then you can try to start looking into um, why those numbers would be what they are in terms of uh, the information. Here's a map that uh, became very popular after the most recent election here in Texas. Um, so this gives several different stories. One, it tells you who, what counties went for which uh, candidate, whether it was Ted Cruz or Beto O'Rourke. Um, so you can see here the counties with the big cities all went Democrat. Um, most of the rural counties went Republican. So that's one story you could tell. Um, then you can also start to put together pieces. So don't, you know, politicians are looking at maps like this and they are analyzing so Ted Cruz won, you know, 222 out of 254 counties. But if you remember, the race was really close. So that tells you that the counties that Ted Cruz won have less people in them, right? So again, that's a story that goes along with this. So lots of stories to tell in simple maps like this. Then there are databases that you can use um, in terms of getting data. And they tell totally different stories. So one of the most popular ones is the Texas Tribune has this government salaries explorer where every public employee or state employee in the state of Texas is listed on this database. And you can go in and see how long they've been there. You can see how much money they make because it's taxpayer money that is uh, paying salary. So um, you can actually go in and look at the state's highest paid employees. So I have the list right here. I will tell you number one on the list, uh, this list hasn't been updated just yet because number one on the list is gonna be Jimbo Fisher, the head coach at Texas A&M. So he's not on the list because it hasn't been updated in the past uh, seven or eight months. But if you go through these, the head football, uh, the head basketball coach at UT uh, makes about three million a year. The head football coach makes 2.7 and that number is going to continue to go up. An assistant coach at A&M makes about 1.8 million. Uh, visiting professor at University of Texas Health Science Center is making that, and I can tell you I am teaching in the wrong field based off of that. Um, the former chancellor, he just resigned. He's been in the news. He and Donald Trump are going at it right now. Um, but he was the chancellor for the UT system, uh, made $1.2 million. Again, another professor, this one at the UT Southwestern Medical Center there, another professor at the Health Science Center in San Antonio. Um, so bottom line, if you want to be a professor, get into medicine. That's uh, the message that I take from there. And then the president of A&M comes in also on the list. So not only could you look at the names, but you could also click on the titles and see how much each head coach makes. You could click on the entity so you could look at the specific university or the jobs. Um, you could look at departments and look at that number. So all of this is sortable, sortable data that you can look at. And yes, you could actually go and look to see how much I make. I covered it with the uh, sad face emoji. So uh, if you don't want to feel depressed over the Thanksgiving holiday, just stay away from this page. Um, then there are several other ways to help tell stories. And these are what we would call data visualization. So this is a really interesting uh, data visualization that the Wall Street Journal did about the pay gap, about how... Uh, women typically earn less at a job at the same exact job than their male counterparts. Um, so you can see they plotted everything on the on the graph here, and the blue dots are 
uh, the males and the per uh, the pink dots are the females on there. So you can see I have child care workers right now, and we're down here on the bottom left-hand corner. So you can see women working as child care workers make about 79% of their male counterparts, and they have the median earnings by occupation there. But then as you start looking at others, so let's just look at PR specialists uh, in our field here. Um, women make about 77% of their male counterparts. So you can see the um, the difference between salaries has increased, so that's why there's a bigger line between the two dots there. And then when you get to the far end of it, um, women working as physicians and surgeons make about 64% of their male counterparts. So that's why that line is so different, because if you look at the actual salaries, it's 209000 to 135000 um, So there's a very big difference there. Uh, between those. So you could actually search for all the jobs that are plotted on this line and see um, what the average salary is for when, uh, women and men working in that field. Here's one that 538 did, and we'll get more into 538 here in just a second, but um, 538 took a look at the number of gun deaths uh, in the country and broke it down by not only gender, but age and race and cause. So this is a sortable database. Every plot on this um, graph right there represents a gun death in the country. So let's go through here and let's set some of these. So you can see I have now selected murders or homicides of men 15 to 34 who were Asian. And you can see this dark um, part of the, of the uh, square there is the number of homicides that were actually male 15 to 34 and Asian. Um, if you just switch that to white, you can see the number got bigger. So this was 913 gun deaths. Um, per 100,000 uh, white men, um, Hispanic, it now becomes 1,166 gun deaths, um, which was 12.4 homicides per 100,000 Hispanic men ages 15 to 34. And then African American, um, you can see the number there. So this can either be a complementary piece of a story or this data could lead you to then do a story. Why are the gun deaths so much higher amongst certain races? Um, or certain age groups or certain genders, or you could look at suicides or, you know, the data help you make that decision either of not confirming a story, but basing a story on that. Um, or you might find a good story out of the data as well. And it doesn't have to be all serious. So this is distribution of letters and words. Um, so if you look, A's are typically at the beginning, N's are more toward the end, Y's are almost always at the end, Z's are usually kind of toward the end. Um, so this is kind of just a little lighthearted uh, way to help tell a story as part of that.